Hello, welcome everybody who is joining us. Good afternoon to everyone. I, for the first time, we're actually all in the afternoon as we gather. Um, as you're coming in, please um, feel free to hover over your name in the participant list and add where you're coming from, whether you wanna add your state or your city or your community foundation name. Sometimes it's nice to know where people are coming in from. And we will just give another minute or so to see if anyone else is joining us, but welcome. Thanks for those of you who are joining us on video. It's always nice to see smiling faces. We'll be rid of this PowerPoint shortly and have more room for all of you. And my co-host from CEO Net, I see Dan Templin on there. Hey, Dan, how are you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good, good. I, you're back from virtual Kansas. That's good, you right. know, from the Growing Community Foundations Conference. So you, yeah, it was you survived. Great. Yeah, it's great. Great conference. They did a really nice job with it. Great, good. Well, it was exciting to be uh, co-sponsoring uh, with them and, and others to make that possible. So, all right. Well, one more time. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, delighted to have you here. We might be having some additional folks join us throughout and my colleague Manuela is gonna help bring them into the room. But I just wanted to you know, reflect that this is in partnership with our friends at CEO Net. But one difference is, is that as we have had to adapt to providing everything virtual, um, I feel pretty fortunate that our friends at BlackBot, many of you know BlackBot, they're actually uh, down here in my neck of the woods of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, but I, I think it's important to note that we could not do these types of events. We couldn't have adapted uh, this quickly to the virtual space without folks like BlackBot in, in, in our back pocket to be supporting these ventures for community foundations. So just a reminder, you know, the BlackBot is, is a solution that is probably supporting now well over a thousand different independent community and, and corporate foundations and plenty of, of charitable funds out there that they, they give great financial and grant making management services. You probably have seen their CR, CRM work and, and the you know consulting services that they offer. So if you don't know them, uh, please take an opportunity to get to know BlackBond um, in terms of how you can uh, better acquire funds and steward your grants and, and your donor services. Um, but at the very least, please just tell them thank you for their investment in our community foundation uh, and the work here we're doing at the council. So with that, we're gonna remove the PowerPoint, make way for all of you. And I get to see even more of you. It's good to see you. Christy's got her her apple for the day. Good, good, good work there, Christy. So, so many of you wonderful friends, uh, excited to see you again. I am going to turn this over to make the most of this time. We've got an all-star cast with you. So as I just um, referenced them, they can wave really quickly. Um, within our government affairs team. It is led by David. David is, um, I don't know where he is on your screen, but I see him uh, there. Um, uh, Jen uh, Holcomb, she is the director of government affairs led by David. Uh, many of you know Miss Stephanie Powers. Um, she is a jack of all trades as we know. And, and new to the team is Nadal. Uh, Nadal waved to us so we know there. So she is uh, getting her feet uh, wet on day what, two, three, four, I'm not sure, but uh, four days in. So thank you for being with us today. At this time, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. We've got uh, a lot to talk about, and so we're gonna make the most of it. So Jen, it's all yours. Thank you, Brad. Um, well, I'm excited to get to see all of you. I'm Jen Holcomb. I joined the council uh, in April as our new government affairs director. Um, just a little background about me quick. Uh, I worked for about a decade, uh, both at the state and federal level, um, and then uh, doing different things, including uh, the legislative director for Congresswoman Betty McCollum for a number of years. Um, but right before joining the council, I was at a small nonprofit where I served as their policy and advocacy director. And now I'm here and getting to work with an amazing team um, and getting to know uh, people throughout the country. So it's been a really great experience. Um, and with that, I would just say too, I really want to get to know all of you. So please send me an email or call me, whatever. I'd love to know what you guys are thinking about, what legislation you're watching, and you know, more importantly, how I can ensure that your voice and your needs and what you're thinking are being heard by federal lawmakers. So um, I look forward to working with all of you. 
now on to our topic. Uh, so what's happening in Washington these days? You know, I'll be honest, I wish I had a really long list of accomplishments, bills that are being passed that I could share with all of you. But the true answer is not a lot is happening right now. Um, but there's one thing that I wanna start with that actually is some pretty good news. Uh, on Tuesday, you may have seen Chairman Neal and Ranking Member Brady uh, from the House Ways and Means Committee introduced a new retirement package. There are a number of provisions in there, but one of the things that we're you know, excited about is they included some parts of the legacy IRA bill that we were supporting. So the provision in there expands current law to enable seniors starting at age 70 and a half to make tax-free IRA rollover uh, contributions to charity through lifetime, our life income plans up to $130,000 per year. In addition, uh, there's a provision that would allow seniors to make a contribution to charities from other qualified retirement plans, such as 401ks, so not just IRAs. Um, we don't know what will happen with this package. It may uh, get some play when they come back, or it may, we have to, may have to wait till next year, but it's great that they introduced it and at least those provisions are in there right now. We'll continue to work to get even more included if we can. Um, what else is happening? I'm sure you all saw on Monday, the Senate confirmed Justice Barrett to fill Justice Ginsburg's seat on the Supreme Court. Um, and right afterwards, most senators left town joining their House counterparts in their districts getting ready for the election. So I don't think we're gonna see too much happen between now and uh, probably mid-November when members come back. One thing that is happening though, is uh, conversations appear to continue between Speaker Pelosi and Secretary Mnuchin. Um, though at, I think we've passed 100 days now of these negotiations, and I, I can't tell you that they're getting any closer to a deal. Um, I think Speaker Pelosi today just sent a letter to her caucus with all the items that she says the administration hasn't responded to her on. Um, so we're gonna have to wait on that for a little bit longer, I think. But I think the good thing is that those negotiations are, at least the conversation appear to continue to happen. Um, and you know, even if it takes us a little bit longer, hopefully we'll see something at the end of all of this. The last thing that you know, I'm really paying attention to right now, and I'll get into, a, I guess, a few more things, sorry, but is you know, we're five days away from voting ending in this country for the 2020 election. And you know, with that, so much is gonna depend on what we're looking at next year, who we're talking to, what policies we're focused on. And so, you know, really watching the outcome of that election and what that means for policy and for many of the council's priorities. Um, but before the 117th Congress is sworn in, we do know that members are gonna have to come back and do a few things in the lame duck. One of the big ones um, is gonna be funding the federal government. Right now, federal funding expires at midnight on December 11th. And so to keep the lights on in the administration, um, agencies in Congress, they're going to need to work out a deal to at least get us through probably the first couple months of 2021, if not, you know, something all the way till the end of the fiscal year on September 30th, 2021. So we're going to be watching that and how that plays. Um, the other thing we're definitely watching in the lame duck is the negotiations on this COVID bill and what that means, you know, what's included. Um, I just want to spend a few seconds on what we're watching and the kind of our priorities. Uh, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the first thing I think that we are really paying attention to is, you know, hopefully an increase in the above the line charitable deduction that was included in the CARES legislation. So right now there's a $300 temporary charitable deduction for 2020 that's included. We wanna see that not only expanded to at least include 2021, but we'd like to see it um, increase so that, you know, individuals can get a deduction of a, you know, one third the standard deduction or approximately 4,000 for individuals, 8,000 for couples filing jointly. The other thing we're watching is funding for state and local governments. You may have saw the Wall Street Journal today had a major story with a headline, US states face biggest cash crisis since the Great Depression. You know, just the decrease in tax revenue for all governments has been really significant during this pandemic. And unfortunately, unlike the federal government, many states have a constitutional requirement that they can't run a deficit. And so we are seeing the impact, and I know you guys are seeing it on the front lines, on everything from education, human, uh, health and human services, 
programs, transportation, basic infrastructure. Um, and we know that when government isn't able to uh, fill the needs right now, they're coming to you and they're coming to other philanthropic partners and you know, needing the help. And right now, or at no point, can philanthropy fill the hole that government should be um, stepping up? So we're definitely watching that. We're watching to see how that plays out. Uh, the last thing that we're definitely watching is, you know, the inclusion of nonprofits in whatever relief provisions are in legislation. So for the Paycheck Protection Program, we'd love to see that possibly expanded or extended. Um, but we want to make sure, you know, just like it was in the CARES, that nonprofit organizations are able to take advantage of these relief programs. We want to make sure that not only are they um, able to participate, but that, you know, we really recognize the uniqueness of the nonprofit sector and make sure that they are getting, you know, their fair share as well. Um, so yeah, I was just going to pause real yeah. quick and, and just say, um, and anyone else that wants to ask any questions there, but, you know, on the um, payroll protection plan, as you noted, it's really just important how that, um, if I'm correct, that was the first time we really had nonprofits um, as part of such a, a critical piece. And so that um, certainly required a lot of uh, coordination and uh, legislative um, approaches from across the board. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's pause real quick and just yeah. see, based on anything she has brought, she brought up several different things, any questions or clarifications before we, we continue to hop around in conversation. Just uh, feel free to flag me down uh, using whatever the feature is to raise your hand or throw it in the chat. The chat is perfectly fine. Um, I, I really appreciate that, Jen. It, was there anything else you wanted to touch on? And just for a flow, I didn't even reference the flow of operations today. We've got uh, David that's gonna help us talk about some donor advised fund regulatory um, issues that and challenges and discussions that are taking shape. Um, Stephanie's gonna help us on, on some activities around CARES Act. And as you just heard, Jen was giving us a, a general update uh, around the Washington update. But anything else from you, Jen, before we, we shift gears? No, just if there's any questions and to say that, you know, we're working hard, but we're working with our PSO allies and the nonprofit sector on all of this. So we're trying to really work together as a team. All right. Well, again, uh, jump in with your questions, your clarifications. Um, Miss Stephanie Powers, um, I wanted to bring you in. We were quite busy there for a while when it came to CARES Act and that actually having uh, a direct impact on community foundations. Uh, some of them being called in to uh, assist with the distribution of funds, some millions of dollars in some cases. Might you share with us a little bit about what you were hearing and seeing and, and why this is influential that community foundations were being called upon, which probably traditionally was, was the United Way uh, space uh, for this type of activity. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Brad, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you um, uh, who might not know um, the work that I do at the council in our public policy uh, shop, um, my role has been to develop the relationships with the executive branch of the federal government. <clears throat> so that really means translates into the White House and federal agencies. So um, I will say this spring, um, I was pretty busy um, on lots of webinars and phone calls and uh, meetings with um, federal agencies trying to monitor um, what they were doing and how all of this um, money was going to flow out the door to communities, um, trying to get a better understanding of <clears throat> not just the CARES Act, but um, there were several pieces of legislation that were passed. Um, I, you know, one of the things I want to do today <clears throat> that Brad and I've talked about is we wanted to hear from all of you about how the CARES Act and maybe um, some of this other funding that's come into your community has really been playing out in your communities and how much interaction maybe you have had with your local governments um, about the implementation of CARES Act and the flow of those dollars to, to meet the needs of people in your community. But I thought it just might be good um, to review a bit sort of, um, you know, how the beginning began, because um, I was going back through my folders and all of the my notes from from the spring. Um, and um, I was really struck by sort of how much really has happened. Um, just for those of you, just, just a little bit of a reminder, the CARES Act really was the third package. 
um, that passed at the end of March. And that was preceded by two packages that had been passed earlier in March. But what really struck me in one of the pieces I was reviewing is that the first, um, the first act, the first package was signed on March 6th when there were 11 confirmed COVID-19 deaths. I mean, I, I just sort of sucked in when I read that. I thought, oh my gosh, there were 11 then and they were already moving to, to move large amounts of money <laughs> into, into the economy, into communities. Um, you know, there are uh, several funding streams related to the CARES Act, which included increases in um, certain federal programs that were already established related to health care, small business relief, that's where that PPP loans were, were in, uh, unemployment assistance for the state, as well as a piece, a second kind of part of the CARES Act, um, which was the emergency supplemental appropriations for federal agencies um, to help states and communities really manage their frontline responses to the pandemic. Um, you know, there, as I was going through my notes, I was reminded that there were two, essentially two key policy objectives of the administration in the federal response. And I sometimes think this is good background information um, for people that aren't doing the kind of work that we do every day, because it helps to explain maybe why some things happen the way they do or positions that certain um, officials take. But there were two key policy objectives. One was to provide some liquidity for the business sector, really through these kind of free loans from the government that came through the SBA. Um, and there were others that came directly from Treasury to large corporations like the airlines. Um, and then secondly, to encourage employers to keep their people employed um, in an effort to keep unemployment tapped down. Um, of course, I think history will render the judgment on how successful that approach was. So we won't make any comments about that now. <clears throat> but the emergency uh, supplemental piece basically flowed, it, it flowed the funding out of uh, federal agencies through federal agencies regular budget streams. So um, a lot of that money really has a long shelf life and it's still being pushed out uh, the door by these agencies like Health and Human Services and Education and USDA, Agriculture, Commerce and HUD. Um, and you may, you may have experienced this um, in your communities. There was a lot of confusion and angst about how federal funds could be used and how quickly states um, and communities could get that money into their coffers because they had real urgent needs, particularly around, around the health needs, the public health needs, PPE, um, you know, the closing down of schools and businesses. Um, the expenditures of the Coronavirus Relief Fund, the CRF, which is something that probably you may have had interaction with your local officials about, that was Title V of the CARES Act. <clears throat> um, that money um, had to have, has to have documented ties to COVID impacts. And with the lagging guidance, it took a while for guidance to get out um, to states and local governments from the feds. Um, a lot of them were kind of reticent about acting too quickly without that guidance for fear that they would be then required if they misspent the money, <laughs> they would have to pay that money back. Um, and I think that translated into some trepidation um, for some community foundations that we heard from at the time who were being approached by their, their local um, municipal officials, um, but without uh, you know, a lot of really clear guidance about um, what the documentation was that was required. Um, there was another large tranche of federal funding that came through FEMA as soon as uh, the national emergency declaration by the president was issued for all states and territories. And that unleashed a whole nother piece of money <clears throat> that came through, through FEMA for things through FEMA's um, funding structure. Um, so the disaster funds became available to all the states for assistance um, with things like the transport of PPE, the movement of goods and services. If you think about disaster and disaster response, these are the regular things that FEMA do in disasters, making sure food and water and public health um, is, being, um, is being addressed. Emergency housing for COVID patients at the time was another piece of that <clears throat> when people weren't quite sure what we were really dealing with. You know, frankly, the pandemic really hasn't had any precedent in our lifetimes. 
The closest I can come is the stimulus money in 2009. Um, in response to the Great Recession, many of you, some of you who are on this call were, were working in your communities at the time and had a familiarity with, um, with kind of the response to that. We saw many governments reach out to the local nonprofits and to their philanthropic community then uh, and their education sectors to help for help to incorporate um, social innovation, community resilience uh, designs into that um, relief response. Um, in the case of CARES, uh, we heard from a few community foundations that were approached by their local governments uh, to help with these coronavirus relief funds, these CRF funds distributions. Um, I'd had some conversations with El Paso, uh, San Diego, Chattanooga, and Tucson about their different scenarios that they were being approached with. Um, in, in most of these cases, community foundations were approached to be a conduit to do grant making to nonprofits in these communities, either as a subgrantee of local government um, or a contractor to local government, um, probably neither of which made too many community foundations feel totally comfortable because it's not a role that I think most of you play. Some do, but uh, I think most do not. Um, and I think it, it presented some challenges because the community foundation, you know, the philanthropic world is not naturally set up for the type of documentation that government typically does in order to justify expenditure of taxpayer dollars. Um, and frankly, you know, even if the money became available, I heard this from several of the community foundation CEOs I talked to, if the money even became available quickly, the community foundation itself didn't have the staff capacity. They couldn't staff up in time. You can't find the talent that you might need. And, um, and some of the technology um, that was necessary, um, that would be a requirement as well. Um, I know in San Diego in particular, the county um, was working very closely with the community foundation to apply for federal funding that was going to come down through um, the Economic Development Administration, EDA, uh, to implement a pathway toward economic recovery in COVID, um, to rebuild um, their economic kind of infrastructure with some resilience. Um, and here the community foundation you know, was a key partner in that. Um, given that we're, we're going to see more coronavirus funding uh, coming down, we think there's gonna be another bill, some, something passed in the lame duck um, when Congress comes back and then potentially um, another large package uh, <clears throat> after inauguration. Um, particularly if there is a Biden administration, um, we think that um, there could be some really strong opportunities for new partnerships with local government, um, with other uh, entities in your community um, related to emergency management or economic development or workforce development, um, especially um, other nonprofit groups that are in, in your communities like the United Ways or some faith-based groups as well. I think post-secondary institutions are another um, as well, uh, given that you know we can see what the implications have been in education, K-12 obviously, um, or even as a step as a as a, st a stepped up role as a convener to ensure that you know, there's more um, equitable citizen input into how this money, some of this money will play out and get and get uh, used in, in these communities. So I think that, oh, yeah. And now yeah. I just wanted to, if I could turn to asking what people are seeing in their communities and what, if anything, you all have done that you'd like to share with each other and share with us. Uh, and that's where I was headed to. Uh, I was going to ask Brad from Palm Beach, if he doesn't mind, if he would join us. Uh, you know, Brad, you commented uh, to me directly, uh, but I am curious about what voices were at the table. You were referencing the money is going through United Way, which is, is not surprising here. We're just acknowledging that more community foundations are being approached and more community foundations, some were even vying for this opportunity to distribute this money. So Brad, just curious, you, you, you said it seemed to turn out 
like it was a favorable when when the private and the the government and or the public and the philanthropic sector were coming together. But curious a little bit more about who some of those actors were and what you were hearing and seeing. Sure. So uh, thanks, Brad. Uh, I, it feels funny when I hear uh, thanks, Brad, and then uh, and my name is Brad. But uh, uh, so actually, so just kind of to go back, maybe three or four years, we had a hurricane hit. And I remember thinking as, a, and we didn't realize it was going to get to us and it started hitting for us. And I realized we didn't have a plan and thought, oh my God, what are we going to do? And it didn't hit us. So the next year we were ready. We actually had gotten together with other funders. So we, significant funders in our area, there are a couple of private foundations, uh, some county government money, uh, there's a children's services council. So we have a group of eight to 10 uh, folks that whenever there's a community issue, we try to work together collectively to, to come together and make a bigger impact. Well, in the process of that, uh, that, that, um, that um, after that hurricane, we actually hosted a grant platform for nonprofits on our website. And for so when, when a hurricane did hit, all these people I mentioned were part of a collaborative and we made decisions together for how that money was to be distributed on the community. And, and so we used that same platform when COVID-19 hit. So all the same people were at the table, but what was different this time is government was involved and uh, they were actually on the calls with us. So especially uh, some of the, the county commissioners that are the offices that deal with really uh, human needs. So you know, the usual hunger, housing, uh, the, the things uh, in health. So, and then the nice thing about, I felt that the role we played in particular was that um, we had money in donor advised funds that went, went out almost <laughs> immediately. We had, we set up a fund and we, I think, so I think we ended up with a $3.6 million impact, which may be small for a lot of you, but for us, that was a pretty big number. And it ended up being, I think more than United Way, at least in our community brought to the table. And that money went out immediately and went out to get testing and went out to do food. And, and uh, so one member of our committee said, we were like, we were the first ones out the door, which was kind of nice. And then, and then the CARES Act came along so it's like the cavalry came and then took over. So, but they were at the table from the beginning when this all happened. And then another initiative through, we have an economic council. It's almost like a super uh, chamber of commerce and all the, it represents the whole county with about, about 1.5 million or so people in the area the size of Rhode Island or, or bigger. And um, so that, um, uh, I lost my, lost my train of thought, <laughs> sorry. Okay, it's all right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Is that another is that another vehicle that you might use then for um, for pulling in some of this money uh, to use in your community then? Right, and then actually that's what I wanted to say. So the, the, this economic council came together and they put together. So the, the big issue was digital divide when all the kids went went to uh, school remotely, especially in our western communities. It's a real farming community, Bell Glade, uh, that area around Lake Okeechobee. And uh, we came together with um, other foundation and others, and the, the business community helped with uh, polls for, uh, to get Wi-Fi access. The, the county took 10 million out of the, the amount that they got from the government to increase the, the uh, infrastructure. Um, some of the, you know, the Verizon and uh, Xfinity, they came together to, to help connected. So we really all work together. And I really think, uh, and I hear this, that this is the first time that as a community, we've really all come together, all three sectors, which is, in my mind, the way we, we should be operating. Great. 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 I wanted to get, uh, I know we're, we're kind of short on, because uh, we want to make sure we have plenty of time for the DAF regulations, but there's two other um, folks or a perspective that I think are critical here. Number one, um, I know Shelly O'Quinn uh, from Anovia Foundation. She's actually in a taxi. Uh, on the way to airport, I think she said, but you know, they, they actually have already distributed about 12 million of the 15 million that they are managing. So, um, you know, Shelly brings a lot of perspective uh, for those of you um, who want to particularly look at it from a regional perspective. She's handling, if I remember correctly, nine different counties across two different states. Uh, but we also have Tracy with us uh, from Paso del Norte. Tracy, you, this, you're no stranger to coordinating lots of dollars in times of crisis. Um, so be curious a, a little bit about your experience and Molly, I thought it was interesting that you were providing the grant making process um, to the local county. So that is great to see um, those different approaches. But, but Tracy, a little bit from you, it sounds like you were managing both money and process. Is that right? 
Uh, a combination, right? Thank you, um, and great to see you and everyone on the call. Um, we have a, a three three kind of tranches. One is a, a partnership with both the city and the county on federal CARES rental assistance, and then uh, help with some basic messaging in the outlying areas of El Paso County. So we've been able to contract with Promotoras to do very grassroots outreach uh, in response. And then we uh, you know, immediately had set up um, philanthropic funds for private philanthropy and we have nine different COVID response funds. We have a huge need still for PPE. You probably see that we're in the news again and um, especially in Juarez, there's been um, you know, not the kind of government response that you've had here. And then um, finally, our health foundation under our umbrella has done some COVID preparedness, recovery and transformation grant making about a million dollars so far um, to help the nonprofits um, think through their business models, you know, help them bridge the gap, but how do they become stronger on the other side? Um, and so that those are largely, you know, our grantees that we've worked with over many years and how to help modernize, be resilient. Um, so all in all, it's about 12 to, to 13 million probably for the region. What we're finding right now in our city and county is that um, oddly they're struggling to you know, race to this deadline to spend all the dollars before the end of the year. So some entities have not been as successful as others at um, getting the dollars uh, spent by December 31st. And Stephanie, we're hoping that there'll be an extension um, just to give some breathing room for municipalities so they don't have to send any money back. They're all working very hard. We don't want them to spend the money on the wrong things just to spend the money. Um, so we're, we're hoping, but they, I understand that's getting all uh, jumbled with, with, an, with the next round of funding if that ever gets passed. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Stephanie, any follow-up uh, uh, before we try to shift? I just wanted to comment on that. You know. This, there, there's this, just this huge, huge political issue, uh, sadly, <clears throat> um, with the administration um, and the Republicans in Congress in particular with state and local, aid to state and local governments. And that has really gotten caught up in, I think, a horrible partisan fight. And um, I think, you know, we're going to see some really tragic stuff if uh, state and local governments are not aided in this process. So. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and, and again, um, Molly, uh, any, any comment about how that originated? I just thought it was interesting that you were providing the grant process, the grant, uh, you know, that's really great to see, but that's a unique role that, that were you at all uh, compensated for that work or was this just uh, collegial being a, being a team player? Um. Yeah, it's, it's actually been a great process. We, we um, well, we are, we, we will be compensated. They tell us we will be, we're hoping. Um, and this was actually, we had developed our own um, funding stream. So we had created a process around providing support for nonprofits and had been, um, we're kind of in the middle of doing that when the county found out about their funding. And so they actually, the commissioners called us and said, look, what you guys are doing is exactly what we want to do. Can you just help us? Because again, timing, we're going to get all this money. We have to get it out the door quickly. Can we just sort of uh, jump into your um, process? And originally they were just going to give us a grant. Um, they ended up, um, it's going to be about 850,000 from, from their money. And they were going to give it to us. And then they decided that that, that because of some regulations would be more complicated. So they said, can you just manage the granting process and then basically make recommendations back to us? And, I, you know, I just got off a call um, this afternoon with the commissioners kind of finalizing the numbers, creating a process. It, it's been a little interesting um, because they, they, you know, they have to use the specific, you have to kind of create a, um, a policy that, you procedure to get them all but then at the end the commissioner's like yeah but we really want to give money to this organization <laughs> so that kind of political kind of comes in which I'm not used to do it's like well yeah just because you like them but they're but you know so it's so we work that out and it's just like well it's your decision you tell us what you want to do and we'll make it happen um, anybody it, can set them straight it's Molly I know you can do it that, that <laughs> I have all the faith in you in the world Thanks, Molly, for, for sharing. And Stephanie, thank you for your, your component. I think if it works out, we're going to shift to David. Christy, I'm so glad you're here with us because we wanted to talk a little bit about donor advised 
and you um, actually, Christy, had, had an opportunity to talk to talk in to, to some of the proposals that are out there. But David, maybe you can give us the 30,000 foot elevation about what, what conversations are taking shape when it comes to donor advice fund regulations, and then we can dive in a little deeper. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think we all know that uh, DAF regulation has gotten a lot more attention recently, and, uh, you know, we know the critiques, all right? So, uh, just to say a couple words about the two major proposals that are out there. The first one, which you're all probably familiar with, the Patriotic Millionaires, uh, they introduced it uh, as a proposal this summer. And it's pretty simple. It just says there would be a 10% pay required payout for three years for both DAFs and private foundations. And um, we have uh, opposed it. Uh, we did a paper, which I can, uh, Brad, should I just put it in the chat of the link to the paper? Yeah, yeah that'd be okay. great. Thank you. Um, that lays out a, the number of reasons why we have concerns about it. Um, everything from, you know, uh, philanthropic communities stepping up. I mean, you know, we, we know that 600 community foundations in all 50 states have granted $800 million since the start of COVID. Um, we, we also argue that, look, you, you double the payout rate, um, you know, future crisis, and there's gonna be a future crisis, but that will make it even harder to, to address the future crisis. And then I think our concern also is that once you have this payout rate, um, that it then becomes permanent. And that puts a lot of philanthropy out of business because things that Congress sometimes does become permanent. And that, you know, wealth is that that wealth isn't going to come back, even though they argue, oh, new money is just going to appear, it'll be fine. Um, we know that that's not likely to be really true. And then, uh, you know, many states, this could this 10% payout could conflict with state laws. And then I think finally, our, our big argument is also, look, um, this is a problem that government has to solve. I mean, they have to be the primary partner. I mean, of course, we're going to be helpful as philanthropy, but, you know, last year, government spent $4.5 trillion. Um, you know, the, the foundation spent 70, uh, 76 billion. So 4.5 trillion, 76 billion. 76 billion is a lot of money, but, you know, we, we can't solve COVID. It has to be government stepping up. So that's the first proposal. We've uh, been talking to Capitol Hill and to Key Hill tax staff about it. There isn't a uh, formal bill yet, but we're tracking that closely. And we led a letter with a number of other of our national uh, PSOs talking about why we were concerned about the bill and why we opposed it. So that's the first one. The second one is this uh, Ray Madoff, uh, John Arnold proposal. Ray Madoff, obviously professor at Boston University and um, John Arnold, the, the philanthropist. And you know, this one uh, hasn't been released yet in any formal way. So it's not a bill, it's not even a formal proposal. Although, you know, we've had, to, we actually had a conversation, our public policy committee had a conversation with Ray Madoff a few weeks ago, just to share our thoughts about it and to hear directly from her. Um, and, you know, it was an interesting conversation. Um, I, I think, um, so I, I think, it, we, we don't know ultimately what the final proposal will be, but I think in draft form, it's got three parts. The first part is some stuff around private foundations, which are mostly really carrots. It would say that um, if you do a 7% payout, then you wouldn't have a private foundation excise tax for any year. And that if, you, uh, if you're a new foundation and you spent down within 25 years, there also wouldn't be a private foundation excise tax. Um, now, there's certain things that wouldn't count towards your payout anymore like um, uh, the uh, uh, travel or salaries for family members, um, but it's mostly carrots for private foundations. There are some pretty um, big changes for DAFs. And so they have two parts. The first one is it would say, you, know, you gotta spend down within 15 years if you're a DAF. And, um, uh, and then the second provision is basically what they call it an aligned benefit rule it would be that, um, well, you'd get the capital gains up front, and the, uh, but that you wouldn't, get the, um, you wouldn't get the deduction until you actually spent the money, and all the money would have to be spent within 10 years after the death of the donor. So uh, there's a third part of it, which is about uh, expanding the charitable deduction for non-itemizers, but there's not a lot of detail there. So obviously the DAF part is sort of the heart of her provision. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to share the concerns of the sector. Um, you know, I've been having lots of conversations with 
uh, various community foundation leaders, um, Clotilde Dedeker is the co-chair of our policy committee, um, and uh, Steve Selesno is on our uh, policy committee. Um, so uh, we have a number of other uh, community foundation leaders there. So, um, you know, we're really trying to share our concerns. I don't know ultimately where this Madoff Arnold proposal will land. Um, we've been trying to work pretty hard to say um, that these time limits are really a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is there some other way of doing this? Um, I don't know that they'll be willing to make changes. So we don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we're, we're trying to be pretty clear about trying to make some changes. And, um, and uh, thank you, David. I appreciate yeah. that. And, and Charles, I see your hand raised. I'm going to get to you in just a short second. But Christy, you had probably one of the most uh, direct conversations with this on this proposal that really got to the heart of DAFs um, really only thinking about it in the context of commercials, where it is not historically endowed, and 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 obviously the difference that that plays out in our sphere. And so I just, if you're up for it, if you can give us a one to two minute, I know that's tough, but just a scenario of what you what you really took away from that conversation that that heightens our awareness about where this conversation is nationally. Yep. So I spent probably 50 minutes on the phone with Ray. I and then you one. I'm really nice guy. Yeah. yeah. And an attorney um, working with her named Cynthia Rowland um, a couple of weeks ago. And I guess um, the thing that they continued to bring up, which I think is interesting, is the, the vast difference they see between community foundations and the commercials. And they continued to stress that and talk about the differentiation. Um, and so I think that that's a positive thing. Um, you know, concerning to me, I get down to the details and in, in talking about the 15 year DAF, I said, now how, you know, how are we gonna track that? What's that gonna look like? And it's their belief that there would be sub funds set up every single time there's a new gift coming in because you'd basically have to start the clock that 15 years every time there's an addition to the fund. And I just, I just told her that's not manageable. That's not, and she, and they really hadn't thought through that that would be any kind of a big deal operationally. Um, and then just, you know, shared the anecdotal stories of the way people truly use DAFs and community foundations. And, and that seemed to be very enlightening that, and, and two, that we don't see a lot of private foundations sending their 5% um, spend over to a donor advice fund. We just, that's just not something that we see a lot of. And yet I believe that they think that that happens um, very often. And so, you know, it was just a real, uh, it was a great conversation. It was real um, in sharing impact. And I think um, fairly enlightening. We continued to correspond through email over the weekend because I forgot to ask, is this a look back to DAFs or is this just a look forward? And so I wanted to kind of get some clarity if I could there. And she just said, I don't know yet, but you know, I, I felt like she really did want to hear from community foundations how donor advice funds are used and what this would look like. And, you know, we also talked about whether or not this could be um, spend rate tracking by entity versus by fund, which would be much more manageable. Um, so I did, I did ask Christy to go to bat for us and she wouldn't do it, asking for five FTEs per foundation for all 906 of you and, a, you know, a brand new uh, software system to manage all these suggestions, but- uh, Yeah, and I shared, it would take away from the community leadership work that yeah. we're doing. Chrissy, you were an amazing uh, voice in that, and thank you for, for taking the time, as were the others that, David, you mentioned who were there. We had, um, you know, Clotilde from Buffalo and Steve from Arizona. I don't think Josh was able to join on that particular call, but plenty of other um, advocates um, in, in the room that had that conversation. So. Um, Charles, I want to get to you. I apologize for the delay. You had uh, a question when we started this. I, I, I might have missed where you wanted to jump in, but please. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, this is back to Stephanie's uh, presentation about the money. And, and I just, this is very brief, but I just wanted to give a different, one perspective that's very different from, uh, and hearing about all the, the money that's flowing and that, so out in our very small part of the world, which is as far Northwest as you can get in, in the continental United States, um, we have seen precisely zero dollars from the CARES Act with the exception of the PPP program, which was 
the lifeblood for many of our nonprofits in our community. So love the PPE program. All of the rest of the money, which we hear about, was sucked up by state and local government, and none of it went forward. And we are a tourist-based economy, so tax revenues are hugely down. And guess what? Every last dollar that came to our county went to backfill the county government coffers for a lost tax revenue. And we saw not one dollar go to a nonprofit, to a cause. And so we've been funding, we write, we're now writing grants regularly to the government to pay for programs, vaccination programs and, and other things. So it's, for, from our perspective, it's a reverse flow. And I just, maybe other people are sharing that. Maybe we're just weird and of course a blue state yeah. and way out here, but yeah. um, it, it's a very different look from out here. Thanks. And Charles, you've been doing a lot. You've been doing a tremendous amount of work in the small business community as well. And, and thank you for all you've been doing. And that was a good perspective to have. Stephanie, anything? I didn't want to uh, cut you off, but uh, it was a good, good comment. Yeah. Um, all right. I, so. Oh, Brad, no, I, I would just say it, that yeah. I, I, I think that's where some of the rub has been, too, with the nonprofit community and kind of, um, you know, essential services that are being delivered by the nonprofits in, in communities, as well as this need for governments, especially these smaller governments, local and county governments, um, who aren't getting their revenues in and, uh, you know, are trying to avoid layoffs of their people as well. Um, so that's why I think there is this real pressure. There's a lot of lobbying going on um, by groups like the National Association of Counties. I kind of keep tabs on them. They have really got a strong, strong push into Congress and lobbying them for a significant package uh, to go to state and local governments because they know they need more money. And Charles, um, and Stephanie, you might know more, but I think it was you that shared it with me. Northwest Philanthropy, the regional association there yeah. in your area, Charles, um, actually was the recipient of two million that they will be responsible for dispersing. And so it might be worth uh, giving your friends a call at the regional association to just learn about what their plans are, how they're approaching this distribution. I know you're a large territory uh, or that region is pretty large. It covers several states, but um, and 2 million doesn't go as far as we'd like it to, but it'd be worth noting that Northwest Philanthropy is one of those recipients. Yeah, of yeah. And, I, and I do think, I think it's one of the reasons I wanted to let you know earlier about, there's all these different pieces of money and they're coming out at different times too. So there may be more money that, that's able to flow um, that, that'll be very um, issue specific or very you know um, program specific too, but. Um, I'm happy to chat more about that, Charles, if you want to chat offline about it. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That's, that's hey. true for anybody, anybody who would like to talk to me about this. I have contacts in the federal government. I'm talking to them regularly, so happy to carry the water. And as Tracy knows, who joined us earlier, um, when it comes to disasters, whether it be natural or man-made, Stephanie is an amazing resource to support you in working through, whether it be FEMA, whether it be working with HUD, USDA, um, USAID. I mean, there's just an, a countless number of entities and uh, she's just uh, been a phenomenal resource when we're responding in a moments of crisis uh, and connecting the dots between the federal and the, and the local. So uh, I wanna jump back into the donor advice fund conversation. We've got about 10 minutes before I promise to get you out of here. Um, what else are you thinking, hearing, feeling? We have been talking about donor advised funds, regulation, um, regulatory environment for the entire time that I've been here with the council, which is now four years. We were talking about it when I was at a community foundation, um, you know, eight years prior to that. And so we've been talking about this a lot and these newest proposals, um, they're just the newest shakedown of uh, approaches that are getting some um, traction this is the first time in my experience that they've been this much about sunsetting. Um, to anyone can correct me because many of you got even more experience and tenure than I do. But this is the first time I feel like it was, it's been so heavily focused on spending these DAFs down and out. Um, and so it's been less about the transparency, um, although that is still big in California, uh, but it's less about the transparency of where the money's going and um, you know, Christy did a good job. She didn't get, because I only gave her two minutes. 
she didn't talk about it, but you know, what role national standards has played in helping us um, uh, be above par with the fact that we have inactive funds policies. We call them active funds policies, but you get the gist. We don't let these funds be inactive. So, so what else? I, I'm just jump offline. Um, David, anything else um, that, that you want to add to that conversation? I want to make sure you, you're there. But other thoughts or considerations as we, we, we move ahead? And, and I second Dan's comments. And Christy, thank you for taking the time to um, educate on our behalf, as, as well as uh, Steve and, and Clotilde and the others that, that have done that. But Tracy, you're with me. I, I see you. I hear you. you want to, did you want to add anything? Oh, no, just curious. I mean, I'm assuming that you'll let us know if there are things that we can do with our local elected officials and then the timing of that and the messages. Um, and then um, secondly, uh, curious to know how partisan is it or bipartisan is it? Is it, you know, does the a change in elected leadership change that dynamic? David, That's a good yeah. question. Um, you know, I, I think there's, I, I think there's concerns on both sides, to some extent, Republican and Democrat, about DAFs. Um, you know, most members of Congress don't even know what a DAF is, right? So um, I think, however, progressive Democrats probably are more uh, sharing these, you know, money's not being spent and, you know, those kinds of arguments. So I think if there's a Democratic president, Democratic House and Senate, it's probably more likely for this to move forward. But not this, I mean, I, I don't think, I think it could still happen in a Republican Senate or even a re Republican administration. So I think we have to take these issues really seriously. Um, one other thing I would add though, in our conversations with Ray Madoff, I mean, she sort of started to raise about, well, instead of a, you know, a 15 year provision, how about like a 5% payout? And, um, you know, could you all live with that? And then it was unclear whether, whether that was by entity or by fund. and. I'm, I you know, certainly love to hear your all's thoughts about uh, by entity. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure by fund that, you know, just the, the burden of that, but, um, you know, what, what would you say to, to, to Ray around that? We'll, we'll just sum it up and Sandu shaking her head. George, I thought you were going to come through the screen earlier when uh, when we were chatting. Um, I, I, yeah, well, I was trying to behave, you know. <laughs> I don't like to fall into the stereotype of the angry Italian, but, um, you know, at some point the Italian comes out. So yeah, people need to understand that, that community foundation DAFs, the minute they come to us, begin paying money out in the form of fees that builds the philanthropic infrastructure that government has abandoned in our communities that we're trying to backfill. So I think we got to sort of be a little more aggressive in having the conversation about why DAFs are an important element, especially in philanthropic deserts like upstate New York. Thank, thank you, George. Uh, Shelly put it in the chat because, well, she's in a taxi, so um, she couldn't uh, voice her opinion here. But but Shelly, you know, it was on the, if any of you didn't follow it, Anovia Foundation was on the front lines of battling where a donor advised fund made a choice um, or wanted to fund uh, essentially what is on the hate funding list or on the hate list, uh, hate groups. And so that was a long battle for them to really try to work through that. And, and I commend Shelly and her team for her uh, working through it, she put in the chat, you know, that we need to have um, policies around this and, and we need to set the bar. We at the council have spent, uh, I've been in a lot of convenings on this in the last couple of years and been grateful for those conversations. Uh, Jen or David, I don't know who's heading that up now, but, but you know, we're working yeah, on a pretty- Yeah, a quick word about that. Uh, so um, we are about to launch uh, a, a landscape analysis of just who's doing what around hate funding and um, you know, what are the best practices and policies to be able to share that with members? So we're, gonna, we're just about to hire a consultant and, um, and then we'll be producing some stuff on our website and a white paper. And it's gonna take some time because we really wanna, you know, this, obviously this is a complicated issue, but you know, what are the legal issues for community foundations and others to be able to deal with this? So I'm, I'm hoping this will be a great resource for the field. So if you have any thoughts on that, or um, you'd like to talk with us, or you have something that uh, you know you think is the best practice, please don't please let us know because we'd love to hear it. 
I, I think it was on one of our recent calls here for anybody who was with us previously where Winsome Salem shared their policies on this that they have um, made public. Um, I have some some resources that that can be put to your disposal around how to some guidance around this about how to talk about it at the board level at the staffing level and, and even at the, the governance um, community level. Um, but thank you, David. I'm really glad we're, we're tackling that in a more formal way because um, it, it's it's a t it's a tough one. Um, I'm getting a friendly reminder to leave one or two minutes um, for for closing remarks. And so thank you, Manuela. She's always got my back. Dan Templin, you're in there somewhere. Um, just a, a you know, a, Dan is one of the the CEO uh, CEO Net leaders as well as um, Molly, who's on with us today. And I saw Steve Jowell earlier and uh, Christy, and I'm probably missing some who might be with us today. But but Dan, um, this is. Uh, we've gone all over the place. And so uh, hopefully we achieved what we wanted was really to let you all know that a lot is transpiring, even though, you know, Jen commented that not a lot is happening, perhaps on the Washington front that we can proudly say is moving forward. There's just a lot to keep tabs on and a lot of moving parts. And I feel very fortunate to have them in the background. But Dan, maybe you could uh, just quickly help us close out here with anything people need to know about you all and CEO Net. Yeah, thanks. If I can just take a few minutes, I want to thank Brad and Daniela, Manuela, and your colleagues at the Council for organizing these CEO virtual roundtables in collaboration with CEO Net. I serve as co-chair of CEO Net with Mike Batchelor from the Erie Foundation. I'm with the DeKalb County Community Foundation in Northern Illinois. Um, and then as Brad mentioned, just pointing out a couple of fellow CEO Net board members in the meeting, Christy Naus from Des Moines and Molly Kunkel from Center Foundation State College, Pennsylvania, and Steve Jewell with uh, Community Giving. Steve and Community Jewell in Minnesota, uh, Community Giving, sorry, in Minnesota serves as a backbone to CEO Net, um, and Steve's helping to manage our efforts and providing great leadership there too. So I just want to, you know, underscore this policy of topic, uh, of policy and legislation topic uh, is very timely and always important. Uh, I think policy and legislation is like the air we breathe. We don't often think about it, but it's critical to our survival. We don't often see its work in action, but it's ever present behind the scenes, shaping our country and communities. And poor quality policy and legislation, like poor air quality, can make it hard to see a clear road ahead and also harm our health as a community foundation field and, and philanthropic sector in general. So thank you to, to David, Jen, Stephanie, and, and Nidal for your work and for being with us today to cover these important topics. I know part of the value of our council membership at our community foundation is the opportunity to invest in your work on our behalf. Um, and finally, I just say anyone interested in hearing more about CEO Net, um, feel free to send me an email. I put my email address in the chat and we'll follow up. Um, we're thinking about maybe having a separate meeting focused on just providing an update to those interested in hearing about our specific efforts to update, uh, organize, and launch CEO Net officially. So thanks again for the opportunity. And, and don't just head out too quickly. I wanted to remind you all, we have the Public Policy Summit, which is coming up November 12th and 13th. Um, there is so much more to cover that we couldn't really get to into the, the depths of this. Um, our policy, our government affairs team, you've been pretty busy. You probably have to figure out you know, how this could all shape up or maybe isn't even shaped up yet by the time we convene on November 12th and 13th. But that's going to be, uh, it'll be much more flashy than, than this Zoom because let's just face it, I'm technologically um, uh, limited, but I want to invite you to that. There's some other um, opportunities there for you to participate. We've got a webinar that I think will appeal to lots of you in the donor development space, um, as well as uh, just continuing this conversation in the philanthropy exchange. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say is we've got one more scheduled, one more roundtable December 8th, and I really encourage you to join me because we're going to be focusing in on new CEOs to the field. So this will be um, any, we're just going to have a handful of new executives who are 
going to share what's keeping them, them up at night. What are they they focused on? What are they they you know hoping to accomplish? And my guess is you'll have lots of food for thought for them, and it will probably be a good reminder for all of us about just how uh, interesting this journey is, whether you're at the beginning, the middle, or the end of it. So with that, uh, have a wonderful rest of the day, and thank you, uh, Government Affairs team, and thank you to all of you, and thank you, Dan Templin, for your nice comments, and thank you to CEO Net. So have a great rest of the day, everybody.